So, uh, hi, I'm Angus, for those who haven't met me before. Um, I uh, learned all my Linux stuff in Sydney, and I've been off in Dublin working for Google for the last three and a half years. Um, and the last probably two years of that, about half my time has been spent on IPv6 things. Um, basically trying to, we, we sat around at lunch, literally, there were three of us sitting around at lunch bemoaning the fact that IPv6 never had a business case and it was never going to go anywhere because quite frankly there's never any, no selfish individual will ever choose to deploy IPv6. So we said, right, in, in Google, the people who need to do the work are this guy sitting across the table and me. We don't need anyone else's approval. Let's, let's just do it. <laughs> um, and we sort of went, ha, 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 ha. And then uh, about a week later, we went, actually, yeah, all right. <laughs> so um, there's a very small team. There's, there's four of us. We picked up some extra people along the way. Um, and um, it turned out to be, given the way Google works, we sort of didn't need permission. Um, if we think it's a good idea and willing to put the work in, and it didn't take a lot of time, um, then that's enough. And we found repeatedly that when we went up to the techs, what you have to do is avoid management. Avoid any conversation that revolves around why. <laughs> Go straight to the guy who needs to do the typing. So, you know, I need help from this NetOps guy who's going to help configure this new device we've got out. I need help from the hardware ops guy who's going to go and actually plug the hardware in for me and stuff. You just talk to them directly and you say, hey, you know, you've got this box. In your spare time, can you just plug this in? It's for IPv6. And they go, oh, IPv6, cool, and they go and do it. <laughs> All right, and that's exactly how it went. Um, so we got um, a... I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how we did it, um, but I'm happy to do so afterwards or in question time if you want. But we have... Um, initially rolled out a separate sort of duplicate network, so we didn't touch the V4 network, there was no risk. Um, and that was done very easily and without any sort of conversations about why. Um, and then after we had that and we could show that it worked and we had ipv6.google.com, which is a user-facing service, um, then we could turn around and say, look, we did it, the world didn't end, now we'd like to go on to the next step and start you know, dual stacking other things and, and the much larger project. Um, and within Google, users drive everything. So if you've got users and you can show user demand, then that's all the justification you need for whatever it is you want to do. Um, so it was important to get that first and then ask permission rather than the other way around. Um, but yeah. So um, today I'm going to be re-presenting two talks that were given at RIPE 57. Um, I'm going to gloss over, it's not going to be as networking oriented. I think the first one in particular is really interesting, um, has some results that surprised me, particularly um, uh, the by country breakdown. Um, yeah, and then the second one's more about um, why we're doing it and what we're doing and things like that. So um, feel free to ask questions at any point. That's, yeah, GL rendering for you. Um, please interrupt and ask questions. Um, I'm happy to take this in different directions. There will be some things that I shouldn't talk about because I haven't cleared them and we like being secret and stuff, but yeah, um, <laughs> I'll make it up as I go along. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also been good with IPv6 thing because we didn't have to be secret. It's not some new product launch. It's not um, a surprise to anyone. It's not really particularly secret how we're doing it because it's... There's all sort of things that's obvious there. What we were doing and when we were doing it wasn't um, something that needed to be kept secret. In fact, we gain a lot more by being a bit noisier about it and encouraging the rest of the world to clean up their act before we get there, um, basically. So this is um, Steiner here is one of the guys um, who's been doing a lot of work. He did a lot of work on this. Pretty much the whole survey thing is his work and the, the, some really good stats analysis on it. Um, so. The problem we found when we got there, we first start, wanted to set it up and we say, okay, we want to set up our first IPv6 capable dual stack um, data center thing. Yeah, just remove the head there, that's right, good. Um, and we said, okay, which, which continent do we put it on first? Do we, do we do it in the US? Do we do it in Europe? Do we do it in Asia? Where are the users? And it turned out there was a lot of superstition. Everyone had opinions. Everyone said, oh, I know, you know, Japan's really into this. I know there's a couple of big deployments in um, Europe. And, you know, the US is the US. They're bound to have some users there somewhere. Um, 
and there was very little actual hard numbers. And when you did look at hard numbers, they were surveys on technical websites. So we usually um, uh, like a registrar website or um, someone who was already involved in the IPv6 community and they were a very technical website and a self-selected technical user group, technical um, users. So we felt it was important to do our own survey because we have a very broad user base um, and we wanted to be sure what the impact. But basically what we're trying to work out here is what's the impact of adding a quad A record to www.google.com, right? It's real simple. When, when I finish this project, that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to walk away, and there's going to be nothing else for me to do on the IPv6 project. That's the end goal. So, um, we found... Yeah, whatever. Um, so, we're concerned about two things in particular. One is um, reachability. How many people can't reach us if we put a quad A record on there? And also latencies. Latency is very important to us. What's the added latency? We're assuming that the IPv6 internet isn't routed as optimally as IPv4. Um, so how bad is it? What's the extra cost going to be? Um, in particular, in this study, we never looked at how many IPv6 users are there. How many people can go to an IPv6 address if you ask them to? That wasn't something we actually cared about. We only care about the dual stack case. If you give both a quad A and an A, how many people take the quad A option? Which is quite different to how many people will take an IPv6 only address. Um, particularly given the way Vista does Torito and um, DNS lookups. So, very simple. Um, we get one in a thousand, I think is the current percentage, um, of Google search result pages. Um, also ping a few addresses. Um, and they ping these two here. Uh, there's an IPv4 only host name and there's a dual stack host name. Um, very simple, it's just a simple, it should be, yeah. Um, we do some deduping by user address and things, in which case that would mostly disappear. Um, unless they also own a slash 24 and rotate through it and <laughs> we have a special special systems to deal with those sorts of people. <laughs> um, there's not actually that many technical people in the world and when you put it together with all of the non-technical people who use Google every day, um, yeah, um, yeah, it'll be fine. Um, and yeah, and then we get the basic stuff that we get off an HTTP request. So we get a browser string and we get the um, remote address um, and that's about all really. Um, we were slightly clever and we have a, um, uh, an HMAC type crypto thing in the URL to try and stop people spoofing it and creating fake hits on these because, I don't know, this might have hit some blog post and the IPv6 community might decide that by spamming one of these they could somehow make us change our policy. How did you select the users? Uh, randomly. It's totally one in a thousand. Sorry, what are the parameters? Um, uh, we, don't want the we don't want the browser to block waiting for this request. So we do it in JavaScript so that it's um, after the page is rendered we have like an onload thing that goes and hits those two uh, one of the two addresses, um, and that way the you know the page doesn't stall. It's sort of to the user, it appears like it's in the background, like an AJAX type thing. Um, yeah. So, uh, a summary of the uh, rest of the results. We found about point two. This was done between I think it's August and October last year. The stats. Um, uh, we found 0.2% of users will take a quad A record if given it. Um, we lost 0.09% of users. 0.09% of users were able to hit the IPv4 and not hit the dual stack um, entry, which is of particular concern to us. Um, and there were, yeah, a lot of different IPv6 hosts out there, quite a lot. Yes. That's a lot of zeros. Um, 
I wouldn't even guess it. I'd, yeah, I'd have to actually pull a calculator out to count the zeros. It would be a really big number. Um, one of the problems we did have is that it's very noisy data, so we had to take it over a long period to try and even it out. And as you look at some of the numbers, there's quite a bit of noise in them, so plus and minus some reasonable error margin. Um, we didn't look at IPv6 only, as I said. There's been other studies which come up with a number like 6% or something. Um, and with the way Vista works, it's quite different if you give uh, an IPv6 string literal address as opposed to a DNS name that will resolve to an IPv6 only address. Um, so we didn't get into that at all. OK, here's the uh, time of the survey. Um, Thankfully, it goes up a little bit as the survey went on. Um, it would be interesting to rerun it now. And one of the problems we have is because it, it's such noisy data, you need to take a long sort of time sample. So it's hard for us internally to get a nice step and go, oh, that was that you know, talk I gave at a conference that obviously fixed the whole IPv6 internet. Is this <laughs> October 2008 or October? This is last year. 2008. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit hard to see particular events and say that, oh, look, this is when we, you know, announced it at an ITF conference and that sort of thing. <coughs> Unfortunately, we'll have to try and get better at that. Um, uh, yeah, these, these host names, by the way, are not as well distributed as our normal dub 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 host names. They're only at a few data centers. Um, so the latency to these host names doesn't represent a normal Google service. Disclaimer, disclaimer. Um, so you get a curve like that, basically. This is hitting the IPv4 only host name. This is not something we wanted to be um, sure of. And an IPv4 user hitting the dual stack host name, doing, doing an IPv4 request to the dual stack host name, is basically the same, right? There's, there's, there's no effect to people who choose to go to an IPv4 um, address from a quad A record, which is sort of what you'd expect and hope for. Um, Yeah. Browsers, I should mention, um, so if you just use the normal libc functions to do hostname lookups, um, get adder info, you will do typically an IPv6 lookup first and then an IPv4 lookup and you'll prefer the IPv6 address. Um, pretty much all web browsers have their own resolver client libraries that have quite different logic. Um, so it's not clear that they'll prefer an IPv6 address when given it. Um, Mozilla has options to turn it on and off and prefer one and disable IPv6 even if it's there. Um, Safari, the newer ones, race them both in parallel, um, which is a quite a good way of doing it for, for HTTP. Um, so it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Both in the DNS region, And the connection. It'll do the DNS mm -hmm. and the TCP connect, mm -hmm. and the first one to return from the connect wins, and they tear down the other one, um, which is a nice way of doing it. Um, yeah, so we want to compare IPv6 against IPv4 latency, and you've got to be a little clever in how you do this. Um, IPv6 users will typically be better connected on, on you know, people at universities with an IPv6 network, that sort of thing, um, whereas people on IPv4 might be dial-up, my mum, that sort of thing. Um, so what we did was we know, we hand out an IPv4 search result page, and if we've, if we've rolled the dice and decided this user is going to be part of the experiment when we're generating the result page, we put in the little JavaScript hook to go and ping our hostname, and in that URL we say, and this is the IPv4 address we saw them on when generating the results page. So when they hit our IPv6, um, if they come in over our IPv6 access, we know what the IPv4 address was corresponding to them that they had just had the search result served to. So we know a link between the IPv4 and the IPv6 address for people in this experiment. So we can use that to go back and look at people who hit the IPv4 only hosts from the same subnet 
and try and do some grouping of users. So this isn't the same user base as what you saw in the previous curves, but we can now compare the IPv4 and the IPv6 hits as being from the same user group. Um, and it looks like that, basically. No. Because there's more IPv6 users using tunnels, right? Um, possibly, or they could just be someone who is given the IPv4 only host name in the random experiment and never asked to go to IPv6. Right. Sorry, so I'll rephrase that. We know right. exactly whether they're one of those two cases because we know which host name they were going to on the request. So we know if they were going so to the IPv4 only host name. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. 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 Um, No, I don't know what they are actually, and they're not. It's not particularly useful information since we've we've only got this these experiment host names are only hosted in a few sites around the world, um, and they are deliberately only a few, and they're in the same both the IPv4 only and the dual stack are in the same location. Um, which is about right, a round trip time to your average web server. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. It's, it's something we'd like to improve, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, this one's an interesting one. This is by day of the week. <laughs> um, basically, what we find out is that people tend to have better IPv6 connectivity at home. Or they're computer people who go in to work on the weekends or something. I don't know. <laughs> people who work on the weekend. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure how we process that. No, it was... Yeah, actually, I'll have to go and look at the stats for that and see how it was done. Yeah. <laughs> that is counterintuitive, right? It's not because you'd think universities are the big IPv6 users right. at the moment. And I go to universities on the weekend and all the academics are my home, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. It's, it's a simple breakdown by week. Read into it what you will <laughs> by weekday. <laughs> um, this one's a really interesting one I found. So, lots of people think that this guy has a whole lot of government uh, projects running, which they do, and that therefore there'll be a lot of. Take up. And this, when we went looking at which, da which location do we put data centers in, this was frequently came up in conversation, right? Um, now, be careful. This is uh, compared to the IPv4 user base. This is, a, this is a relative number. This is not the total number of users, okay? Um, basically, what we find is it's still very strongly dominated by single deployments. This one is free.fr. Um, so you can have a single uh, large deployment. I'll get rid of the mouse cursor there. You can have a single large deployment somewhere, and that's enough to put you on the, the international rankings, um, basically. Um, yeah. So do you have another column for actual numbers of users? Yes, but I'm not going to tell you what that is. Um, I don't have that data here anywhere, I'm afraid. Um, and there's a pretty graph showing the same sorts of things, right? So um, the US does all right. Um, you find some strange places in uh, Europe. Um, and then everywhere else is pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's the zero color. Yeah. And if we made it the same color as the water, it would disappear. I don't know. 
Sorry? Yeah, I don't know. Huh. That's a good question. Yeah. So this is based on the IPv4 address of the user and our existing um, geopolitical placement tables we've got for that. Sorry? <laughs> like I care. Probably. Um, I don't know. Um, okay, and looking at the type of the address, we can also make a few assumptions. Um, we know the 6 to 4 IPv6 prefix. Um, 6 to 4, is a, it wasn't mentioned in the last talk, it's a dynamic tunneling method where you, if you have a static IPv4 address, sorry, if you have a global IPv4 address, public, then you can tunnel over that. And if if you want to, you can recognise six to four addresses and short circuit um, by sending it directly to their IPv4 address um, as a tunnel. So it's um, it's a common thing if you have a public IPv4 address. Nope. Uh, I'll explain on the next slide. Um, three to very low. Um, Torito is a, another um, tunneling method. It's uh, a little bit similar to 6 to 4 in that you can have this kind of, it's not a simple star topology. You can have peer to peer connections, um, but it handles natting. Um, it's used by, it's on by default in Vista and off by default, I think, in XP. I don't know. Um, but it's heavily, what's the word? Um, it's only used in Vista if you ask the box to connect to an IPv6 literal address and it doesn't already have IPv6 connectivity, then it'll fire up this whole tunnel thing and connect to it. If you have a host name, um, if you're trying to do a DNS lookup, you'll get back no host for quad A stuff and it won't even try. Um, so in our experiment, we'd expect to see none of these. This is almost always uh, some Linux user or something running Merido or something else that implements the Torito protocol but has a different connection policy. Um, and some other ones. Um, we can't tell the difference between tunnels and native connectivity because just from looking at the address, they come out of the same sort of address pool, so we can't break them out, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and native connectivity. So the US, 95% 6 to 4 traffic, the addresses we saw in the US. Um, France, as I mentioned, free.fr, 95% of their IPv6 connections were native. Yeah. Is it possible you can, um, I know a lot of the Bureau of Ocean stuff, if they don't know, they just look in the US? Uh, yes, but we were basing this on IPv4 address and we're pretty good at knowing that. We try pretty hard for things like pizza searches. We want to know which particular pizza places to show you ads for. That's very important. <laughs> And recommending languages and other things that are actually of benefit to the user, but yeah. Um, China had a whole lot of native and also a bunch of isotap, which is funny because um, there's very little isotap otherwise. Um, yeah. Uh, yet another tunneling protocol standard dynamic thing. Um, you get a whole subnet unlike um, six to four. Oh, six to four, you do get subnet. Sorry, you're right. I'm talking. Right. Um, this is based on the uh, HTTP headers. We also can make guesses based on the user string as to the OS. Uh, you could fake it, but it's pretty good. Um, so the top one's interesting one. This is where all the six to four users come from in the US. Um, we can also make assumptions about that <laughs> and say, because um, the Apple airport has 6 to 4 enabled by default. Many people who have an airport, or many people who have a Mac, also have an airport as their access point. Um, so we can say reasonably confidently that um, a large number of the IPv6 users in the US are there because of Apple and because of the airport, um, and because of the large number of public IPv4 addresses in the US that allow them to use 6 to 4 as a transition technology. Um, um, yeah, Linux is pretty good, as you'd expect, a fairly technical community. Um, they also have a lot more native than other connection methods. Um, and Windows does pretty poorly depending on the default policy, um, basically. 
um, yeah, the on by default versus the off by default and things. Um, yeah. All right. No clue. The problem I have with this is I have no Windows machines at home or access to any of them at work. So I settle this up and then I have to kind of ask people, hey, by the way, do you know how this Windows thing works and what it does? And yeah. Yeah, Windows. Torito's built into Windows. Um, uh, we wouldn't see those requests. Yeah, um, it was. It's it. It's reasonable technology. It's fairly complicated, but it does the things you sort of need to do to solve that problem. Um, and it's there by default in Windows. It's if you want to write a peer-to-peer -peer app on Windows, you just fire up the right library. And suddenly you have a peer-to-peer -peer IPv6 network tunneling over NAT. Um, it's it's pretty good. Um, but yeah, we don't see requests from that for this particular thing because we're asking them to look up a DNS name, which the Torito policy doesn't do. Um, and that's it, basically. So um, it's still very low. It's growing. We're hoping to make that grow more. Actually, we don't care about the size right now. What we care about is how bad the brokenness is. Um, what's the impact? Um, it's not too bad. Um, this number's too bad for us, 0.09%, but many, many other websites wouldn't have that problem. Um, they would, that number would be acceptable to them. Um, and something I've continuously gone ran in circles with people over is you can't ask people to choose IPv6 or not. As soon as you're asking the user to choose, you've lost. They shouldn't know about this. So it's all about default policy. It's all about whether it just happens or not. Um, and yeah, if we do our job successfully, they won't notice the difference. It'll just silently go to IPv6 one day and they'll never notice and it'll be a huge anticlimax. <coughs> No, no. Um, we were able to find out about the broken clients. The um, Yeah, no, not as part of this because we're doing only the queries from the browser. We're very limited in what we can do. We can't do trace routes. We can't, you know, control the size of our packets. Well, that um, if you at least know the breakout yeah. Yeah, we haven't looked too much in that. These numbers are pretty low, so it's pretty hard to find a cluster of broken users um, without running the experiment for a long time or for with a larger user base. We hope to. That's what we're trying to do sort of thing now. Um, yeah, and 6 to 4 is pretty common. Um, 6 to 4 is pretty common. It, it, it'd be really good if big ISPs ran a 6 to 4 relay or at least uh, Comcast, for example, big ISP in the US. If you're there and you're a 6 to 4 user and you casually use the default 6 to 4 um, anycast prefix to find the, the gateway, um, you'll end up going all the way to Amsterdam. Um, they're a large enough ISP. It would be kind of cool if they plonked a 6 to 4 relay somewhere in their network. And then um, the difference in um, routing path between IPv4 and IPv6 would be, would be minimal. Um, so that's was sort of why I was asking about 6 to 4. It would be quite nice in this case. Um, right, so we intend to keep, sorry, yeah? How many quad A requests we get? Right, how, uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> so what's the impact of doing the, the quad A lookup in addition? So if you're a browser that supports IPv6, you're doing the quad A lookup anyway right now. It's just that you're getting back no, no entries, you're getting back um, an empty result and then you're trying the, quarter, the A lookup. So there's no additional round trips. Um, you just suddenly start returning a result you know, for the quad A. In fact, you, you might even be better because you won't then do the second A lookup. Um, yeah, so no, we can't see that from the JavaScript level and we can't measure that and it's, <coughs> yeah, um, but we haven't tried to look into that more. Um, something we do would like to do, but I'm not sure if we'll 
um, do so because it's difficult, is running the experiment through a different way. Like we could put some things in a Google toolbar or something like that to do some more complicated queries that we control. Um, it's very, very unlikely we would do so because that's a lot of work to roll it out and maintain it. And we deliberately keep toolbar very simple. Um, and we wouldn't want any privacy people seeing the packets go past and get all excited about whatever new thing we're sniffing and sending information off to Google about now. It's, um, it's about, yeah, I'll jump on the other talk. Then. Um, yeah, so are there any questions about that before I finish and go on the next one? Yeah. Yes. Um, something around the 0 0.03, 0 0.04 maybe, I don't know. Um, it comes down to, actually even that would be pretty rough. It comes down to, um, we have an SLA internally for, for web search. We want to have this percentage of uptime, uptime this many nines. Um, this is like some ongoing outage for these people. So we'd have to factor that in and say, is that still within our SLA with our other outages that happened that quarter? <coughs> um, and is that acceptable just to toss those users? But have you um, geolocated that 0.0915 in particular? No, we have haven't done a lot of investigation <coughs> in that way. Yeah. Um, Point oh nine percent of... Good question. What is it? Um, yes, it is. Sorry, yes. It's 0.9% of the 0 0.2. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, yes. Sorry, it's 0.09. No, it's 0 0.09 of the total. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've caught it myself. Um, I, I borrowed someone else's Windows laptop to fix it up for them, and I took it home to my home network. And on my home network, I advertise a, an IPv6 public prefix, and I advertise a unique local prefix, since my IPv6 prefix isn't fixed and, and moves around. Um, and I found the Windows machine would try to connect to IPv6 hosts outside, and it would use the unique local address as a source address didn't work very well. So there's an example of that laptop, given a, a quad-A record, suddenly lost connectivity if it was given a dual stack um, DNS response. Um, we also have, there's, there's CPE little cheapy routers, which say IPv6 tick on the box, and they run router advertisements, they send router advertisements into your network, but if you try and make an IPv6 connection through them, they try and nat it and just totally destroy the packet on the way through. <laughs> um, so that's, that's another case that we know of. Um, yeah? For certain boxes I've seen in the school, if you do a quad A address reduction, it will give you back a null address for an IP port. This. Yeah. Um, so basically, from our selfish point of view, for our use case, what we care about, we would much rather there was no IPv6 connectivity than poor IPv6 connectivity, which isn't the case for other uses, but for us, that's the case. Um, so we would rather a hard no route to host, a hard connection fail, um, rejected, rather than timeouts, rather than lower latencies. Okay, so I don't need to go into this. Why is Google doing IPv6 stuff? Um, So the kind of the real reason is IPv6 is at this point where the technology is pretty much done. As you saw, the reasons for not adopting it aren't technical. They're more political. They're all about there's no users asking for it. It's just chicken and egg. Everyone's just waiting, right? Um, so we're trying to basically use Google's name to tell everyone that, hey, IPv6 is for real. It's not... We've finished that whole development thing that's been going on for ages. It's no longer crazy changes. It's now ready and coming, and you should just accept that and go with it. Um, which so far seems to be working pretty well. When we 
uh, initially announced ipv6.google.com at ITF 71 or something. Um, we first announced it and large chunks of the US couldn't get to us because there was some completely broken peering there. And who knows how long it had been the case. But simply having Google in the thing they were trying to do meant that people reported that to the um, ISPs involved and it was fixed within hours. So we have had pretty good success with forcing people to clean things up, just sort of shining a spotlight on the whole thing and saying, hey guys, it's for real now, start, start repairing things and monitoring it and actually looking at the um, peering tables you have. Um, so we've had, uh, these three are IPv6 only. They're meant to be political statements and toys. They're not meant to be useful services. Um, they are good as an is it working test. They are IPv6 only. If you can get to those, you have working IPv6. Um, and <coughs> particularly the first one has a funky animated logo, which is all very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, these are just search. They're Google search. Um, you can fiddle with the URL and get to some other services. Um, anything that sort of would appear behind www.google.com, basically. Um, but other things like calendar.google.com, no. Um, yes, which is surprising. These aren't meant to be useful services. These are IPv6 only, right? So if you configure your Firefox search drop-down to always use these, and then you go to some other network that doesn't have IPv6 connectivity, it breaks. Like, this isn't meant to be useful. You're not meant to actually use it. <laughs> and yet there are. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, we have um, a reasonably good IPv6 deployment internally now. We still have some pretty um, limiting infrastructural pieces. Um, which we are, I am working very strongly to remove this quarter. Um, so we'll have a bunch more changes that you won't see because they're all internal. Um, and we're trying to be fairly noisy about what we're doing. We want people to know that this is coming. Um, we hope to put a quad A record on www.google.com something like a year or two from now. Right? It'll depend on how well we can fix things up, but it's that sort of time scale. If you're running an uh, administrator for network or an, an ISP, please check it, make sure it works. Um, use these to test. Um, look at the latency and the peering. And from our point of view, you're better off turning it off rather than having some toy deployment that isn't really good. Um, or better yet, fix it up. Right? This, this is coming. It's coming soon. You're going to have your users going to Google over IPv6. Um, and we would both like it if that was a good success experience for them. Um, yeah, so that was sort of stuff I just said. Um, yeah, there's often suggestions of why don't you offer YouTube with a higher resolution or search with no ads or um, some other thing that differentiates, makes IPv6 more desirable. Um, I'm very strongly against that sort of thing because the user should never notice the difference. Um, or to put it another way, at some point it's no longer going to be an experiment, it's going to just be the normal thing and I wouldn't want to have to remove it and go back to whatever it was before um, after that. Um, so it's, it's going to be the same content. Um, and this ties into the study. Um, before I'm sorry, this was given at a different conference to a different crowd, so I'm skipping through some of this that's um, not particularly relevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good statement, isn't it? <laughs> True. <laughs> um, <laughs> I should change that, yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's a little embarrassing, so the ITF meeting, so those haven't been in an ITF meeting, um, every time they get up there and they show the uh, maps demo of uh, Google Maps fetching map tiles and doing lots of parallel requests and consuming lots of ports on the carrier grade NAT solution. Um, and then they have a little knob they can twist and go, let's say we only allow this many ports per user reload. And then the map tiles break, like you get a couple of broken ones. So it'd be nice, since we're being used as the example, 
it'd be kind of nice if, if that all worked. So that's the next product I'm going to get going over IP6. Um, here was a particularly bad example. Um, this was a real trace route. Well, the packets don't actually go up in the air like that, but you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, where, yeah, a simple trace route ended up crossing the uh, Atlantic several times, uh, Pacific several times. Um, yes, an IPv6 trace route. So we found a lot of these problems. Um, there still are a lot of these, but we're slowly uh, reporting them where they affect a large number of users. Um, and uh, other people are repairing them. Um, and, yeah, it's to do with peering, surprise. Um, so yeah. No, I don't, and I choose not to find out. <laughs> um, yeah, I would be very surprised if they weren't already aware of IPv6 and had perfectly working IPv6 solutions in the uh, uh, Great Firewall of China was the question. Um, um, yeah, so we are trying to, because the IPv6 Internet is fairly poor uh, regards to peering arrangements. Um, we are trying to peer directly with lots and lots of networks over IPv6, and that way we have a much simpler debugging path. There's no sort of intermediate parties, um, and we can be sure that there's no tunnels and all that sort of stuff between us and them that might make it difficult. Um, so this so far is working as a, an approach. Um, and it lets us, yeah, put pressure on people to get a, a proper production deployed network. Yeah. Does that mean you only have to peer check the IPv6 port? Uh, no, but that makes it much easier. Um, you obviously need to peer with us at a place where we peer, and mm -hmm. typically you would already be peering this with us over IPv4 if that was the case. Um, but no, there's, yeah. Um, we have, oh, I don't know, yeah, it wouldn't be a reason. Um, here's some particularly bad ones again. This is a trace route from the same city to the same city, and it happens to go via Amsterdam. <laughs> um, so this is the sort of thing where we're trying to uh, avoid transit and things, because you get a lot of these sorts of problems where the, for now. Um, all right. We have uh, just announced it publicly about, I don't know, what was a week ago? Um, www.google.com slash IPv6. There's a little blurb. It's a little colourful and cartoony. But um, the, uh, what we're doing is we have on our DNS servers a whitelist. If your DNS request comes from one of the addresses in that whitelist, we will hand back quad A records for www.google.com. So um, my home was the first place in the world to get it, and it worked okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we now have uh, quite a few big networks. Free.fr um, is one of the larger ones. Yeah. Um, yes, we could. No, we're not likely to do it. Um, so two things. At the moment, our DNS servers uh, we're only serving DNS over IPv4 at the moment due to some infrastructure limitations with the way we do DNS at the moment. Um, so this is all IPv4 addresses for the actual DNS transport. If we started, if we offered a shared DNS server that everyone could use, we lose all of our geolocation stuff. So we would have no idea which data center to send you to to get the closest one, those sorts of things. So it would actually be um, a step backwards. Um, Yes. 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 We're hoping to do it with that. Um, we. It's still a very low number, so it's hard to get good data out of that. Um, but if we leave it running long enough, we hope to use that to bootstrap it. Yes. Um, turns out there's nowhere. Nowhere has. No one has IPv6 geo data. You can't buy it from anyone. It doesn't exist. Um, so we have to build it. Um, that's not our business. <laughs> um, so, 
in fact, this also applies to this conference. Um, this, I've turned this on for our network, but you won't notice it because if you do a normal DNS lookup, you're going through Arnet's DNS servers, and I didn't feel like whitelisting all of Arnet just now. Um, <laughs> if you send a DNS request from the actual IPs you have here, you'll be getting back Quad A records for dot dot dub and a bunch of other um, of the popular things. Uh, most notably, not YouTube, not video, uh, and not Mac tiles. Um, they're not on it yet. Um, when I get around to finishing it, um, which will be in the next month, two months, three months, some, sometime soon. Um, video is a lot harder because our content distribution network, I'd have to change all of that, which is a lot more servers involved. Um, Um, Arnett's talking to us, um, so people on Arnett hopefully will be able to take part in this. Um, basically what we want from people, yeah look, pictures of DNS requests. Um, basically what we want are people with a production quality IPv6 network um, and no tunnels to us. Um, and they want, we want them to be prepared to fix problems. Um, be able to detect problems and fix problems that they that might turn up with their users and how they get to Google. Um, and the good, yeah, this, the two peering thing, we peer in Australia in Pipe and Equinix, I think. Um, so if you peer with us through there, that's that's fine. Or if you're on the root servers there, that's fine. Sorry? Pipe in Sydney. Pipe in Sydney, sorry. Pipe in Sydney and Equinix in Sydney. Um, so if you appear there, um, come and talk to us. Um, send an email to google-ipv6 at google.com. Um, and if you go through something else that's well connected like Arnet, then it'll come eventually down through that channel um, as we roll that through that. Um, and yeah, that's it. I'm done. Um, we have all of a minute. Any questions? Uh, yes, um, we can remove your whole net block from the whitelist if it's in it. Um, if it's just you as a user, and right, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, at the moment, it's all just done by email to that address. Um, it's off the Google.com/slash/ipv6 page. Um, yeah. Yes. 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 Um, there's some similarities. Um, so this was comparing IPv6 take up uh, to the digital TV, analog to digital TV, and the fact that they're turning it off and using that as a threat to make people move. Um, it's not so easy to turn off IPv4. That's that's a pretty big <laughs> deal. Um, and what does that mean anyway? There's no sort of central switch. Um, the I think we are going to see a lot more top-down government mandated thou shalt require IPv6 in your government department purchases. Um, and that's a similar sort of, you're putting a false requirement on it to, to bootstrap the take up. Right, and, and uh, the EU has a similar um, thing and I believe Australia is even mumbling about something, I don't know where they're going to go with that. Um, any questions? Yeah. Um, if you give a quad A and an A response, you will get 0.238% of people will take the quad A option. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. But the question is, of course, if Google put what I request it tomorrow, would, would not most folks still go to IPv6 overnight? The problem is quite the issue. Not quite overnight, but that's something I'd seriously consider. Just rip the band aid off, right? And 
um, particularly what one approach could be to publish this, let the networking community know that on this flag day, we're going to add a quad A record there. So if suddenly you start getting weird, hard to debug connectivity problems, perhaps you should look at um, IPv6 usage around that time. That's one approach. Um, it's not one we're likely to take, but it is, like, at some point we are going to do that, right? Once, once we get to an acceptable level, we are just going to plonk in the records. Um, yes. Yeah, we could, we don't, for the purposes of this, we don't care about the actual IPv6 usage, the, the total usage numbers. Um, what we're caring about is the quality of the IPv6 deployment. Um, obviously it would be nice to have more IPv6 and less IPv4 and things at the same time. But, um, we have some good uh, anecdotal evidence things from Arnet users typically who say things like, oh, it's faster over IPv6 than over IPv4 because you find a lot of these educational networks have quite different peering and contractual arrangements. The IPv6 money comes out of a grant and the IPv4 money they have to earn themselves and that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, that could also be the case, yeah. Will we ever turn off IPv4? No. Um, well, at least not until there's some IPv4 users left. Um, I, for a web server, um, a web hosted content, I'm not interested in IPv6 only solutions since every IPv6 only user must have some solution to get to the IPv4 internet in order to be useful at the moment. And that's actually not too hard to do technically. You can run a dual stack proxy and a dual stack DNS resolver and you're done. You can have an IPv6 only client um, who has quite good connectivity to both IPv4 and IPv6 websites. Um, and that's, so the IPv6 only isn't something I'm particularly interested in. Right. Yep, Thank you. come and find me around talk, um, send me email, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Thank you.